Hello, I am Anavoltos, and today I am going to do a, a part two of the answers to questions since I got more questions and also because today I don't actually really have time to make a, uh, a gaming video. So I decided to do something that would be a lot easier to edit. So anyway, um, I've got a couple questions. And uh, the first question uh, that I've got today uh, from Amphibian Hoplite. Um, it's always nice to, to see what you've got to say. Count me as one who is late to the punch. But my question will be related to this as a fellow YouTuber. Do you even have time to watch other YouTube videos? Okay, and I think that that is a very interesting question to ask. Um, and, uh, an additional question, uh, that follows that up is, or what I mean by that is that, do you have a schedule to when you upload and when to watch or some sort of system like that? I know I'm confused. I can barely check my grammar for this question. And honestly, I, I don't mind the grammar on that question. It's fine. It's fine. But anyway, um, as to the question, do I watch other YouTube videos? Um, I certainly do. Um, I, I do watch uh, plenty of, of YouTube myself. And there are some YouTubers that I prefer to watch over others. And actually, I think that is a great idea for a video to make where I can, I can say my top 10 favorite YouTubers or something like that. And it's also a way to stay up with uh, what's happening in the community. And uh, also, um, I guess another important thing would be to see what the current memes are. I don't know. <laughs> but uh, I, I find some content his artistic uh, has artistic quality and I do watch it. As for a schedule, well, I generally watch YouTube um, in the afternoon, um, so I I guess that's sort of a schedule, but that's only because there's some, some people that upload at around that time, and I like to, uh, to jump the shark on that, but um, I don't actually have a specific schedule as to when I upload. Well, no, I, 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 by that I mean I do have a time period that I like uploading, which is uh, 12 on UTC, uh, which is the universal time scale, which means it doesn't scale with uh, daylight savings time. And, and I like that. So I generally upload at 12 UTC. Um, sometime, some days I don't upload because I don't have a video to upload, <laughs> but, uh, other than that, I don't really have any specific way that I divide up my time for these things, but generally in the things I do every day, I try to find a time to, uh, either make a video or edit a video or, or do something like that. Um, and a, a follow-up question, well, this isn't a follow-up question, this is a separate uh, question. Here's a semi-political, semi-theological question. What do you think of King James onlyism, or even the ESV onlyism? I think that the latter is meant to be a spoof kind of view, but I'm not sure. Okay, now... This is a, an interesting question, I think, and not not only because I'm a Christian, but because of uh, because of the history behind these things. So, for those who don't know, King James onlyism can describe a number of different uh, views um, in uh, the textual criticism of a Bible. Specifically, there's of uh, the the view that the Byzantine text or the majority text is the text that best uh, describes what the apostles originally wrote in the New Testament. There's also the view that uh, 
the five editions of Erasmus and um, the one from Stephanus and the one from Beza that the King James Version of the, Bi of the Bible are based on are uh, accurate uh, tr translations of the Greek New Testament. And then the final view is that uh, only the English King James Version is the true word of God and God is done with the Greek and all other versions of a Bible are either uh, either not very good or to the extreme they're heretical and need to be destroyed. Now, I think that the final view is probably the more rare view of these things. But um, as for ESV onlyism, I do think that that's probably a spoof. I can't really think of any reason why an ESV person would be an ESV onlyist. Now, that being said, I understand that uh, in some circles there is the idea that, uh, let's say you're in a Bible study and everybody's studying the Bible, it makes sense to all, for everyone to have the same version so that uh, you're, you, you don't get confused when somebody's quoting something. And that's that's one thing. But as for the actual issue of a of a textual criticism, the way I understand it is that there are three different textual traditions in uh, the Greek text uh, as to how that relates to uh, Bible versions. There is what is called the Byzantine text, uh, which uh, has, has a big overlap which, with what is called the majority text, which was primarily the type used by scholars and, uh, and clergymen in Greece in uh, the Middle Ages and also um, earlier on there's some traditions that come out of the Middle East in that. In addition to that, the Byzantine text uh, after the fall of Constantinople made its way into Western Europe and became more common there and was eventually uh, the primary type that uh, Desiderius Erasmus uh, reconstructed his version of the Greek New Testament from. Also, there's what uh, some people would call the Western tradition, which is uh, the line that comes from the Latin Vulgate and was commonly used in Western Europe, although it uh, decreased in use with the expansion of the Byzantine text. And a, a compilation of, uh, I think, some of... Uh, the Erasmus translations was eventually sold under the name of the Textus Receptus. So a lot of people will refer to the textual tradition behind the King James onlyism as the Textus Receptus. Okay. Um, in addition to that, if uh, we're, we're going further, there's also something called the Alexandrian text which uh, is a bit less common and was historically less used than the Byzantine or the Western. Now, of course, different scholars may have different names for these things, and there's some overlap in some areas, and there's also some minor offshoots as well. And the difference generally between the Western, not the Western, the the... Alexandrian and the Byzantine is that the Alexandrian has some of the oldest uh, examples, making it uh, theoretically um, based only, if, if you're only taking the historical record and you're not putting any conjecture in, that puts the Alexandrian text to be the oldest text. Now, the Byzantine text or the majority text is called the majority text because it has the most manuscripts. That is to say, it was hand copied the most times and uh, we have the most surviving copies of it. Now, 
uh, one thing that I'll, I'll sidetrack here for a moment. One thing that is notable about uh, the Greek New Testament is that it is probably the most uh, the most extant example of any ancient text that was written on on paper or parchment. It is it the oldest copies of the Greek New Testament are centuries older than the oldest copies of the works of Julius Caesar. And that makes it one of uh, that that means that if people completely reject the Bible as being a thing that was uh, originally written in the first century, you would probably, based on the same assumptions, have to reject most other ancient texts simply because of the fact that there's a lot less uh, extant copies and the extant copies of most of these texts are a lot younger than that of the Greek New Testament. But that's an entirely sidetracked here but let's get back on track here so my so my opinion here is that what matters most is to get to what uh the apostles originally wrote or what uh one would call the autograph of uh, the actual copy that it was originally written down or originally recited to and written down by a, by a secretary or someone like that uh, in some instances. Now, no autographs have been found, of course, and we wouldn't expect that um, from the Greek New Testament. It, not that we would expect it from any other text as well, <laughs> because we do have a lot more of the Greek New Testament than we have of any other text. But... Uh, Another thing that's uh, important here is that the Alexandrian text is indeed the oldest text and also happens to be uh, significantly smaller in volume than uh, the majority text. And why is that, you say? A lot of King James onlyists will complain that the NIV, the ESV, the NASB all have uh, ser several verses removed and that it's much shorter than the King James Version. And they accuse the editors of those versions of uh, having cut out pieces of the Bible. Now, however, it is notable that if we study history, we see that the scribal uh, tendency is to actually add historically, which means one would expect the oldest version to be shorter. Not, I'm not saying that the shortest version is the best version. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying that from a historical standpoint, a shorter version is more likely to be the regular version. Now, most of these... Uh, additions are uh, things where, let's say someone says Jesus in the original, someone may say uh, Jesus Christ, and then someone uh, may say the Lord Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. A and it generally works like that. Things get elongated. Now, the reason why things would get elongated is because um, scribes that are dealing with a text that they consider to be important don't want to accidentally miss something that's in the text. But if you're writing by hand with a, a method that doesn't allow you, allow you to erase and also paper isn't the cheapest thing in the world in that time, then you may end up, uh, if you miss a word, you will have to make a correction in the margin. But also... If you're commenting on something, you may also write in the margin. So sometimes there's some ambiguity and something may be inserted in uh, simply because it's in the margin. And people don't want to accidentally miss something that's written. Now, 
another thing that's notable here is that when Erasmus was was writing his Greek New Testament, he didn't have all the sources he wanted. In fact, he had to uh, translate, uh, reverse translate uh, some parts of Revelation, which is why in uh, in Erasmus's edition of the Greek New Text of the Greek New Testament, there are some readings which are. Uh, a bit different than what you would usually find in other textual traditions. And uh, in addition to that, there's a whole issue of the comma Johanneum, where someone told him that something was in the Bible, and he originally didn't believe it, and he said, show me the manuscript, and then someone showed him the manuscript, but uh, later on it was found that the manuscript was actually uh, a forgery. So, <laughs> someone tricked Erasmus there. In addition to that, uh, the two biggest things that I would say are different in uh, versions of the Bible are uh, the, I'm going to mispronounce this, the Percapole Adultery, where, uh, where it's the Pharisees bring an adulteress in front of Jesus and and ask Jesus what they should do to them to to her and and they want to stone her but Jesus said let he who is uh who let he who hasn't sinned among you I'm paraphrasing here throw the first stone now the problem here is that number 1 it doesn't make sense honestly from a theological level and if you really want me to I'm, I'll make a, a video on that but from both a theological and a historical level that makes no sense and number two uh, that only appears in later readings so that is uh, one big difference between the majority text and the Alexandrian text where people say that is a, a Bible story that was indeed added and the second one is the long ending of Mark and and an important thing to note is that actually none of the textual variants, that is to say, none of the places where the Greeks have the, the Greek New Testament has different readings actually has any bearing on uh, Christian doctrine. Now, there are some places where things may be a little bit more ambiguous than they normally would be, but generally speaking, there is no Christian doctrine that uh, you can get from the King James only version that you can't get from the ESV or that you can get from the ESV that you can't get from the King James only. Those are all there. It, for example, some people accuse uh, a certain verse where it mentions the Trinity that uh, isn't in the ESV. Some people accuse the ESV of undermining the Trinity, even though the Trinity is somewhere else in the ESV. It's just that uh, based on the older texts, which theoretically would be closer to what was originally written, if there was a significant number of older texts, it would theoretically be closer to what was written. Th those things don't appear there, and therefore they are trying to get as close as possible to what the autograph originally had. And that's what's important here, because that is what was inspired. Now, there are some people that think that God inspired the King James Version specifically, and number one, there's no real evidence for that. But uh, another argument that I've heard is saying that um, the reason why we don't have uh, the, the so-called Textus Receptus or the ecclesiastical text, as some people like to uh, fictionally make it up, um, throughout the Middle Ages in Western Europe and then back to the past, is because uh, the, the reason it's less common than 
other versions during that time period is because people used it all the time or the reason why it's not as old uh, historically as the Alexandrian text is that people used it. Now, the only problem here is that uh, things like this Textus Sinaiticus, uh, I may have mispronounced that, actually show a lot of use throughout the centuries. In addition to that, just because a text is used a lot doesn't mean that people don't take care of it and doesn't mean that you wouldn't have at least one copy of it that has survived. Come on, guys. These things were used, and that's, number one, a poor argument, and number two, it's an excuse to say that your viewpoint doesn't require archaeological evidence when the other viewpoint has archaeological evidence. So... That's that's just uh, my idea on that. Now, if somebody wants to talk about a specific thing regarding uh, textual criticism, I am up for that. But let me just say that I am not the PhD expert on these things. Now, if you want to know more about textual criticism than uh, of the Bible specifically, then I would recommend you to the things written by uh, Dr. James White, uh, with, who's with Alpha and Omega Ministries, and uh, specifically his book, The King James Only Controversy. I think that that is a very well-written book that uh, is, is very accurate on these things. So anyway, <laughs> that question probably took quite a bit of time. Wow, we're already at uh, 21 minutes. So let's move on to the next question. And the next question is, of course, um, from Freese of Web, uh, which um, very nice. Next question. What important truth do very few people agree with you on? I think that's a... Uh, a very uh, interesting question, and also specifically <laughs> a, a very open-ended question on the kinds of thing that I actually asked people to ask me, which was, let's let's see if I can lose some su subscribers here. Okay. <laughs> very few people agree with me on this. Okay. So going back uh, to what uh, I said in the previous video, the climate change thing is something that there's some scientists with credibility on both sides of the aisle. Now, there are more on one side than the other, uh, which means there's a majority which puts me in a minority viewpoint when I say that uh, I agree with certain scientists that, that uh, humans have not had as great an impact on the climate as certain other scientists uh, assert. That is my viewpoint on that. And that viewpoint is a bit controversial, but I think it's definitely not as controversial as what uh, is probably the most controversial thing to talk about. Um, uh, something even more controversial than politics, of course, religion. There you go. Very controversial. I just talked <laughs> almost um, 20 minutes on biblical textual criticism, which isn't really the same thing as talking about uh, theology itself. But let's see. If you are a member of a certain religion, if you claim to believe in a certain religion, you should believe it to be true. If you don't believe it to be true, then you are a fool. Um, as let's I'll give an example from the Bible itself. The Apostle Paul said that if Jesus Christ did not rise from the dead, then Christians are the most pitiable people in the world. And you know what? I, th I think that's true. If you don't believe in the things that your religion asserts, then why are you that religion? If you don't believe in the resurrection of Jesus, what are you doing in church? <laughs> so, yes, I I do believe in uh, the supernatural events as described in the Bible. And I also uh, believe in 
the natural events that are implied by it. Um, specifically speaking, let's see how let's see um, controversy level slowly rising. Specifically speaking, I am a young earth creationist. There you go. There you have it. Uh, out of a closet on that. Um, goodbye subscribers <laughs> and hello hate comments. Okay. A and what do I mean by that? I, I mean that, uh, it is as the Bible says that the world is created by God and that the age of the world is, um, the range I put it as, uh, six to 10,000 years old. Uh, that's that's a pretty big range, and the reason I do that is because of uh, various chronology issues, and and I think ten thousand is the absolute maximum age that it uh, actually can physically be. Because uh, here's here's the next big shocker: I'm not actually a creationist, or I didn't become a creationist because I was a Christian. I was actually a Christian before I was a creationist. And uh, no, no, I was a creationist before I was a Christian is what I'm trying to say. So, and the reason I became a creationist is because of the science. Yes, that's right. It's not a science versus religion thing. It's a religion versus religion, science versus science thing. And I could probably talk about this all day. Um, there's a whole bunch of different arguments, the scientific arguments as to why the earth cannot be millions of years old. And also as to how the geologic column is, uh, better explained by a global flood event than by millions of years of sedimentation. And there are many resources uh, online that you can probably look up on this. But uh, let, let me just put some examples out there. Number one, number one example here is that uh, radioactive dating is shown to be incredibly inconsistent when applied to objects that have a known date or objects that have a known relative date. And what do I mean by that? Well, uh, I mean that an object that we can actually historically date, not prehistorically date, uh, in other words, we already have an accurate dating method to date it before we use uh, the radioactive dating, is uh, very inconsistently dated radioactively. You have living animals that are believed to be thousands of years old uh, when uh, that type of animal specifically could not be thousands of years old. And you have all sorts of weird mishaps with people trying to radiocarbon date things that uh, they think are old, and then they find out uh, that they're not really old, but they already radiocarbon dated it, or, or just not, I'm not just talking about carbon dating, other radioactive datings uh, apply as well. And those things do end up to be old according to the radioactive dating, even though they have a known age that is significantly less. Now, when you get into the deeper uh, radioactive dating, where the margin of error becomes tens of thousands of years, I don't think that that is really something that um, one should be bringing up in debates, uh, specifically because it doesn't really engage with the creationist points. And by that I mean it presupposes that the world has the ability to have that sort of margin of error in dating. In other words, it presupposes that the world is millions of years old to say that the world is millions of years old. So that's not really the kind of thing I want to see in debates, but uh, people will use it anyway. <laughs> Speaking of which, um, there are things that have been debunked year after year after year that uh, evolutionists continue to use constantly. Uh, example, okay. There was, um, I, I forget the name of a guy who did it, but uh, he made drawings of uh, embryos that uh, 
uh, of various creatures, including humans and chickens and fish, etc. And the way he made the drawings, uh, it was later found out that he had modified them to make them look more similar than they actually were. The only, uh, it was uh, Ernst Haeckel, I think, was his name. And the problem with that is that that's very dishonest. And the other problem with that is that even though it was proven s over a century ago that these things were faked, uh, in more recent decades, college uh, textbooks still had those images, even though they were entirely inaccurate, which uh, is very problematic. Um, another one is the idea of uh, certain vestigial organs, specifically the Cossacks, uh, which is not a vestigial organ. It is actually an organ that is useful, which, uh, people, well, people say, oh, well, it, it used to be a tail, but uh, there isn't really any evidence for that. In addition to that, the Cossacks has a function, which means you can't really say that it... Uh, wouldn't be consistent with a creationist viewpoint since it already has a function. People used to think that the appendix was a vestigial organ, uh, but it does serve a function. Um, people used to think that certain bones in a whale were uh, vestigial. The only problem with that is that those bones were actually very important for reproduction. <laughs> so... Uh, and, and, uh, and the other problem is that people still make these arguments today. And that's that's the other big problem. Okay, more creationist stuff. Um, trees, okay? Fossilized trees that are fossilized vertically. And they transcend multiple layers, multiple geological layers... So you can see the layers and you can see the tree go straight up and down through the layers. And in some cases, multiple coal seams, which uh, really puts into question how old uh, or how fast these layers were sedimented. Because, of course, they had to be sedimented fast enough for the tree not to decay, but to petrify instead. Which means that the layers are much closer in age than one uh, may have originally thought. In addition to that, it has been experimentally proven that it is possible under certain conditions to rapidly form coal and other fossil fuels. In addition to that, it has also been proven that uh, under certain conditions it is possible to also rapidly sediment uh, on uh, to, to rapidly form layers of sedimentation and also it has been proven that it is possible to rapidly wash out canyons um, and these things are very present in the areas surrounding the mount saint helens eruption where we see both of these things at work with uh channels being dug rapidly and also uh areas getting rapid sedimentation so I'm not the PhD professor on this, though. I, I look at the evidence that both sides are bringing. In fact, I have listened to uh, dozens of debates on this where one would presume that both sides would have to give their best evidence. And that is where I make my decision based on the argumentation that they have made, not based on the personality of the argumentation, not based on the humor of the argumentation, not based on how much the two uh, opponents that are debating ridicule each other and ridicule each other's positions, which I do not think is a very legitimate form of debate, but on the evidence that they have brought forward on the numbers, on the facts, and also on the responses, on the refutations that they have made. Now, that being said, not everybody falls into the same category on all these things. There are a wide variety of viewpoints. Um, for example, there's a, a viewpoint between um, the how much punctuated equilibrium there would be and how much constant evolution there would be. And there's also the issue with Haldane's dilemma 
and how evolutionists choose to deal with it, um, specifically the issue of how rapidly something would have to uh, mutate in order to change to a different form. So that's that's a whole bunch of different things. But uh, I, as always, let me emphasize that I am willing to consider my viewpoints. I am willing to listen to someone who comes and respectfully makes their point in a clear manner and who is respectful while doing it. And I'm willing to listen to that point. And I am also willing to engage such points in uh, the same polite and courteous manner, ideally. Now, I know that there are some people... Um, on both sides, but uh, uh, more commonly on one side, if you know what I'm saying, that really like to play this all for laughs and don't take the other side seriously, which I don't think is a good thing to do in a debate because it really, uh, if, if you're not going to take the debate seriously, why debate in the first place, honestly? So anyway, thank you all for listening. Um, hopefully I haven't alienated you too much. Um, in addition to that, uh, thank you all for listening. Thank you all for your amazing questions. I love doing this. Um, hopefully I haven't put too many ums and uhs and random pauses in the video. I know that I do tend to do that sometimes and I do apologize for how that breaks the flow. But uh, thank you all for watching and I will be seeing you all next time. And I will toss over and out.